Lord, help us, we pray, as we come before you this morning now, this time of study and serious thoughtfulness, and in a short while, as we come before you in holy worship, I pray that you'd help us to gather up our minds and hearts, so that we may present ourselves before you, and not be distracted by uh, things around us, or the wandering of our own hearts, or um, any uh, sinful inclinations that we might have in this very time. We pray that you would be with us, and that you would come to us, and so speak to us that we are enraptured by you, our God. So help us in these things, Lord. Grant us wisdom and understanding, and your Spirit to, to guide us. Amen. <coughs> Right, so just a reminder, we are considering uh, chapter 40 of the Westminster Conf uh, Shorter Catechism, which you'll find in the back of your hymn books. And I should have looked up the page, but I didn't. Um, but I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, and of course, we're on the section to do with the law. So we are that section of the hymn books, question 40. Not of the Heidelberg Catechism, which you'll also find there, but of the Shorter Catechism. And that question reads, what did God at first reveal to man for the rule of his obedience? And the answer is, the rule which God at first revealed to man for his obedience was moral law. I remind you that we looked in past times to see that this law is written on our hearts. And then we began to consider last time the fact that this law is permanent permanently binding, binding on our hearts and consciences. <coughs> and that is a particular word to us who live in a day when people live by and large without conscience. Uh, and where in public and in business and in politics and so on, uh, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you can get away with it. And, and the issue of your conscience binding your heart, holding you to account, is something you very little hear of these days. We speak of moral renewals and what is it that the government comes up all the time and they, they give lip service to this and there's very little practice. And the same is true in the church who by and large flouts the law of God in a whole variety of ways where God's law and God's holiness is very little valued. So today, let's start with a story, true story, a story about Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford was a godly father and family man and uh, had in his household um, the practice of welcoming those who needed hospitality, a Christian duty. And on a day, there came a stranger to his door and asked for a place to sleep for the night, and he was taken in. And of course, if he went to a Puritan home in the Coming into home in those days, you um, would have found that not only would they put a plate of food in front of you, same as whatever everyone else was having most likely, but they would also make you sit down and listen to the family devotions. And so this uh, stranger joined in the family devotions, and it happened to be the place uh, where the question came up, how many commandments are there? And the stranger, it was his turn to answer this question. You see, everybody had to answer, and he was asked this question, and he said, well, it was 11. And they said, what? <laughs> of course, uh, the stranger was thinking ahead, and he said, a new commandment I give you, to love one another as I have loved you. And we looked a little bit at that uh, uh, last time. But we come back to it now because we need to get our, our um, hearts around us, you see. Um, so then, uh, when Christ gave his new commandment, was he wiping out all the old ones? No. That man who had come along, by the way, he was Bishop Usher. Uh, who was the Archbishop of Ireland, uh, the head honcho in the Church of Ireland. 
and come in disguise because he heard about Samuel Rutherford and he wanted to see for himself. Uh, but uh, Archbishop Usher got it right. He's not saying there's now one commandment and the other ten are gone. There's eleven. Right? So the commandments, the new commandment does not wipe out the old ones. Um, and then what about Christ? When Christ came, did he correct the law? Did he have to make changes here because the law was uh, inadequate? Uh, no. Right, he didn't need to add anything to it. Not at all. He didn't add one little bit. He didn't change anything. Instead, he defended the law and he interpreted it. Right? You've heard that it was said long ago, you shall not commit adultery. I tell you, anyone who looks or blessed has committed adultery in his heart. In this way, the Lord establishes the law. The law of the Lord is, there's a word for it in Psalm 19, perfect. Okay, so when we're reading in our question, that uh, God gave this rule for his obedience. It's a perfect rule. The law of the Lord is perfect. And Christ recognized that it was perfect. And Christ upheld it and defended it. But wait a minute, didn't the Bible also say that Christ fulfilled it? And doesn't that mean, because he fulfilled it, that it no longer applies to us because it's been fulfilled? That means it's been dealt with, it's been done with, Put it away now, it's fulfilled. Yes? He fulfilled it in obedience, and we are fulfilling it in Him, in obedience. Yes. Well, yes, so we, we don't. We, we are yes, in, in a way, we are fulfilling we are that's, that's, that's true, but not in the same way that Christ fulfilled it. Christ no. fulfilled it perfectly. He gave perfect obedience to God's law, and He rendered an obedience that was sufficient for every one whom the Lord had chosen to save. In fact, it would have been sufficient for everyone if the Lord had chosen to save the whole world. Yeah. So, so Christ fulfilled the law completely. kept it uh, perfectly, and he fulfilled it in himself. Uh, so the law, because Christ fulfilled the law, that does not mean law is abrogated under the New Testament. It follows a question from that. Can you be righteous by keeping God's law? Can you no. attain that? No, because you can't keep it perfectly. If you could keep it perfectly, maybe, except that you start off with something, right? What do you start off with? An already sinful heart. Okay. So you have original sin, which uh, even if you kept the law perfectly, you would not be able to uh, overcome. And yes, you have also a heart that's inclined to sin all the time. So ever since the fall, righteousness and life cannot be attained by keeping God's law. And we're told by Paul, no, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You can read that in Galatians 2, verse 16. Okay, so, what then does the law do for the people of God? What use is it? What benefit is it to us and to all men? It's like the user manual. Like a user manual? Okay, yes. We yes. live thereby. You must live thereby. Okay, yes, very good. Of laws All right. To make us aware of sin, really. Makes us aware of sin. <clears throat> All right, let's think for a moment because we're, we're stepping into some, uh, some uh, interesting area here. Uh, but God's law is useful to all men, okay? Not just to believers, it's also useful to unbelievers. Um, and uh, but you do have to use the law properly. So as Molly said, there's a user manual. Uh, well, yes, but you, you, you need to you, you need to understand what the law does. 
um, before you, you, you leap into it. Right? And um, we, you read these words in 1 Timothy 1. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. Okay, so we've got to just understand carefully and, and use, make sure you're able to put the law into its right um, use. So when it comes to unbelievers, what use is the law to unbelievers? Is it a um, user manual to unbelievers? Does it tell them how they should live their lives? And, uh, yes. Well, yes, uh, but um, that's not the main thing with unbelievers, because unbelievers um, have no ability, no inclination. Um, and yes, of course, the laws are there to tell everybody what, what, what's right and wrong. But in the case of unbelievers, uh, the law does something most important. It tells them something most important. That they can't keep it. That, that they can't keep it. Yeah. You can't keep it. So let me ask Thomas a question. Listen carefully, Thomas. Does the law show the sinner that he is good or that he is bad? You can tell him wrong. Does the law show, t uh, tell the sinner that he is good or that he is bad? Thomas answered you. Oh, sorry. I thought you said what? <laughs> sorry, you said bad. Very good. Yes, bad. The law shows us that we are bad. Good answer. It shows us that we are sinful. So the, the, for the unbelieving person, he learns that he is sinful from God's law, which convicts him, that condemns him. And uh, it also shows him that he just can't keep it. Okay? He's failed again and again and again and again to keep it. And even if he has tried to keep it, and not all unbelievers even try, but even if he tried to keep it, he failed. Okay? And so that the law teaches all unbelievers who will listen. The Bible says that the law was... Um, put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Okay, we're not saved, we're not justified by the law, but instead when we find that we've come to an end of the road, we failed to justify ourselves and that we are bad, not good, and the law has shown us that, well then the law also uh, takes us by the hand like a schoolmaster might and leads us Christ. Galatians 3, 24. So how does the schoolmaster bring a person to Christ? How does the schoolmaster bring a sinner, the law schoolmaster, how does he bring a sinner to Christ? Well, he will teach the law. He will teach, yeah, he, so he's teaching the law, but by, by, by him, by the person trying to keep it and he can't, uh, more teaching doesn't help. It just makes oh, the condemnation sorry, worse. So the question is, how, how does the law actually help us? How does the law help the, uh, the sinner to, 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 to in the end come to Christ? Christ? Sorry? Showing us we need something more because we can't keep the law. Yes, yes exactly. We, we need something more than the law, right? What do you need then? Savior. You need a Savior, right. Exactly. But, but more particularly and specifically, we need to, the, the law requires a perfect nature. Okay, your nature, your, as a person, must be spotlessly holy. That's what's required. You know what the law teaches? Yeah. You've got to keep the whole law. And you've got to do it. And you've failed. So there is a spotlessly holy nature that is required. Christ alone has it. What else does the law require? Perfect, perfect obedience in every way. All the time. Perpetual obedience. And it requires that somebody must obey. That is all fulfilled in Christ only. And of course the law also requires that where the law is broken, there must be punishment. Punishment, yes. It must be satisfaction for sin. Alright, so we can learn these things from the law. 
And we can learn from that that none of us are capable of achieving that. And so unbelievers are thus forced to see that they really need Christ. If only they will listen. And Christ has done all of these things for them. So the Lord channels you, directs you to Christ. Right? In Romans chapter 10, Paul speaks about the Israelites who tried and tried and tried to keep the law. Um, they did their very best, but they failed. And so he then says, well, Christ is the end of the law. So that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. It's like um, the evolutionists you see are trying and trying and trying to work things out. And they get to the top of the mountain and they find that the Christians who believe in creation have been sitting there all the time. Okay? Uh, similarly, all the works of the law that the Israelites were trying and trying and trying to keep and do and failed, um, the end of it all is Christ. So that there may be righteousness for everyone, not who keeps the law, but everyone who believes. Okay, so, does the law have this effect on all unbelievers? <coughs> no. Why? Let's ask Luke now. Luke, why does the um, law not have this effect of teaching everybody the right way to Christ? Why does it not have that effect on all unbelievers? Here's the answer. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. Very good. They're deaf to what the law says about their sin and about the danger that they're in. They don't want to know. Right? You've tried to talk to your friends about the gospel or your family members, about Christ and about sin, and they really just don't want to listen. They're deaf. And we're told also in the scriptures that all men are without excuse. So the law is there to help the unbeliever to see his need for Christ. But what about the believer? Does the law do the same thing for us or is there a different purpose for the law? Now let's think about the user manual again. The law is written on our hearts, yes. And and knowing that, that, that we are in Christ and with the liberty that we have in the Holy Spirit, we, we live a blessed life as if we kept the commandments. We, we've got all the blessings of keeping the law. Yes, Christ. what a blessing that is. So that's the blessing in justification. God regards us as if we have perfectly kept His law. And that is a true and dear blessing that we must never let go of or lose sight of. Okay? But um, for the believer who has already now found Christ, or Christ has found him, uh, and he is in fellowship with Christ, he wants to. He wants to. He now wants to keep Christ's law. God is, is inclining his heart to keep his law. Alright? That's now sanctification. And, and the process is not, not by any means complete. We find that we still sin when we want to do good. But the Lord is beginning to do the work in us. So He inclines us to keep His law. And um, he, he does more. What, what else does the Lord do for, for, for you? The Holy Spirit also teaches us to enjoy the law. Okay. In degrees. <laughs> In degrees, yes. No, that's right. The, the, the enjoyment, not, uh, not only in, in, in actually doing what the law requires, and there is much delight to be found in doing what is right. Okay, it's the way of blessing. But also we enjoy... Righteousness. We enjoy the righteousness that He's given us, which it may, is because the Lord begins to help us to see what He's done for us, and that makes us thankful, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it gives us gratitude for what God has done for us, what Christ has done in fulfilling the law for us. 
So that which the law was powerless to do, um, in that it was weakened by its sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. And for, for this, for what God has done in Christ, that we are deeply thankful. What else did Christ do apart from fulfilling the law? What did he do in connection with the law? That you need to be thankful for. He took our punishment. Yes, he took our punishment, exactly. So uh, there is a curse that comes on anyone who breaks the law. Okay? Um, and he endured the curse in our place. He took the punishment for disobedience in our place. For that also we need to be enormously thankful. But coming back to the user manual, the law benefits us when we conform our hearts and our lives to it. As the rule of our obedience, and there we now back to our question, question 14. The rule of our obedience. So if you have a rule from Christ for your obedience, when you do actually conform your heart and life to that rule, then you receive great benefit from the law, because it's Christ's tool in His hands to conform your heart. And so Paul writes in Romans 7, For in my inner being I delight in God's law. Has his heart been conformed to God's law? Yes, to some extent. Okay. Do you say with Paul, in my inner being I delight in God's law? In my very, very, very inner being. <laughs> Sometimes it's quite deep, right? <laughs> yeah. But every Christian should be able to say that, and it should be true to some other extent in all Christians. In my inner being I delight in God's law. <laughs> and he says, so that is... Uh, what I'm saying is we conform our hearts to it, but we must also conform our lives to God's law. And there again, in the same book of Romans, Paul writes in chapter 12, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test what God's will is, His good, perfect, and pleasing will. Amen. So you must be conformed. How are you conformed? By the renewing of your mind. To what are we conformed? Well, it doesn't actually tell us in that verse. But we know from all the scriptures that we must be conformed to God's holy way, which is revealed in His law. And then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is. So there it is, His will. His law. His good and pleasing and perfect will. So, and, all, and all scripture helps in that conforming because it's all given for teaching. Yes. Yes. Just going back to the first question, I think it may be helpful to say that a great deal of the New Testament is concerned with changes to the way the law applies to the life of a believer from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. So, as I've been trying to say on Sunday night, the law... Uh, in its, in its, uh, in the hooking, in its statutes, in the Ten Commandments, or what the Confession here calls the moral law, that is unchangeable. Mm. But the way that it applies to you in your daily life, Christ brought a wonderful freedom to us. Mm. So we're not all making plans to get to Jerusalem in time for Pesach, right? <laughs> okay. Mm. Um, now, of course, in Israel, it wasn't a burden; it was a lovely holiday. But for us, it would probably be a burden. We, 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 so, um, I think you, that really needs to be appreciated, the, the freedom of the Christian in the New Testament, and the fact that um, we don't need to become Jews first in order to be real Christians and the covenant people of God. And uh, you see that concern very much in Romans and in Galatians and in Hebrews, and it's a wonderful thing. 
So Christ's fulfilling of the law means that it also changes in the way that it relates to us. God's will for our lives is, is wonderful and we have a tremendous freedom uh, because the law hedged Israel in. And I think that's what Paul means in Galatians 3 when he said he was a schoolmaster. He's talking about Israel at that point. The law constrained them so that they would have to keep on looking to God's Messiah. It led them to Christ. It's a wonderful thing. And now the Messiah has come and uh, we are wonderfully free. We've been set free. We've been redeemed. Uh, I hope that helps you understand the New Testament a little bit better. So we're not free from the law to just indulge ourselves. No, we are free to keep the law at its heart and its intent, even better than ever before. Thank you. Right, I think that um, close to the end, let's, let's uh, just pause for a moment and ask, uh, are we under the law then, or are we not under the law? Um, and of course Romans 6.14 says we're not under the law, we're under grace. And perhaps you, like me, have heard some preachers very vehemently say, we're not under the law. Don't, don't think that you have to keep the law anymore. And they, they can be very uh, persuasive on it, but they're persuading you to antinomianism. And it's not uh, right and biblical. It's a text that is wrenched from its, its uh, true meaning. And the fact that we're not under the law but under grace, uh, well, we don't have to keep the law in order to be justified and the law will not condemn us anymore uh, if we fail to keep it. So we are not under the law in that sense. But we are under the law as our rule of duty. And preachers who preach uh, the antinomian understanding of Romans 6.14, you're not under law but under grace, they forget that Paul also wrote, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 21. And so we are still under the law, under Christ's law. And it is one and the same law. Um, and uh, it is our happy privilege to have such a rule for our living. Let us pray. Oh, um, are there any last questions? No, it's great. Lord, we thank you for your wonderful law. We remember the many psalms that extol the beauties of your law, and we uh, pray that more and more, like the psalmist, we may be full of wonder and amazement at uh, the uh, tremendous beauty of the law of our God. Thank you that you've given it to us in fine detail in the scriptures. Thank you that uh, there is so much blessing to those who walk in its ways. Thank you for delivering us from its curse. Thank you for our Savior, the Law Keeper. And thank you that in Him we are righteous before you. We bless you for your many mercies to us in this. We pray that we may not despise or take for granted what you have done. We pray in Jesus.